Tonight, I am going to be continuing talking about the book, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism by Chogyam Prampa. And we are on chapter two, titled Surrendering. And uh, Prampa Rinpoche would use the word neurotic a lot when re referring to his students. And uh, so he, in this chapter, he talks about the relationship between working with our quote, neurotic state of mind, end quote, and working with a personal guru. So surrendering here means opening up to life situations in a non-neurotic way as working with a spiritual friend. So it has both those meanings. Working with our life in a non-neurotic, egotistical, delusional way, as well as the spiritual friend. And he talks about uh, like how much are we going to defend? How much are we going to let go of? And if we open up, at what point do we become defensive and shut down? And one of the things that made him such a difficult as well as good teacher we've already talked about, but I'm going to remind you, is that he really came from and presented himself as a highly realized being. He did not hide behind humility, uh, which um, made him quite difficult to be around if you were coming from a neurotic state of mind, because he would see right through you. Now, those of us that have had a student-teacher relationship with Kent Carter Rinpoche, he saw through us too, but he usually didn't let on directly that he was seeing right through you and seeing your neurosis and so forth. Whereas a Trungpa Rinpoche would just uh, come right out basically and uh, let you know that uh, he was seeing right through you. So we bring in his words, a trunk full of expectations to the relationship that we have with our guru or our spiritual friend that we think that this relationship should uh, be a certain way. Now, this talk was given in 1970 or 1971. The book is a collection of talks that were given in that period of time. And since this is in the earlier part of the book, the first part of the book, I would surmise that it was given in 1970. And there were a lot of expectations and so forth about uh, the guru, what they should be like and so forth. But this is still relevant today. It's still pertinent today how we bring our expectations, our neurotic expectations, to the uh, student-teacher relationship. So um, we uh, have to let go of thinking that he or she is perfect, a simple and wise person, uh, whatever we expect, he mentions a lot of different things. 
Um, quote, surrender means opening oneself completely, trying to get beyond fascination and expectations, end quote. So here it is just plain opening ourselves up completely, letting go of the defenses, letting go of having this line that can't be crossed, that if we get to this line, then that's it, my defenses go up. And uh, we become very protective, very defensive, and, uh, and so forth. So it means keeping that defensiveness down, doing what we can to not have uh, this line. We all do anyway. You really have to be a highly realized being before you don't have this ego attachment and this uh, ego, you might say, barrier that I'm not going beyond, that at this point, fear jumps in and that's it, I'm shutting down. He also defines surrendering as, quote, means acknowledging the raw, rugged, clumsy and shocking quality of one's ego, acknowledging them and surrendering them as well. So this means looking deeply within oneself, getting to know your ego. And it's interesting, the words that he used here, raw, rugged, clumsy, shocking. These are pretty strong words. But if we really look deeply and closely and see our ego, we really have to admit this, that it's pretty raw. It's pretty clumsy that someone like Kenpo Karta Rinpoche, Shogun Rinpoche, Rinpoche and so forth, can see right through this clumsiness. I'm just going to speculate here, a bit like we can see as adults through an eight-year-old and see what they, uh, what they really want, what motivates them, and so on and so forth, understand their temper tantrums, their games, their strategies, and so forth. So uh, surrendering means that we get to know ourselves and our egos much, much better, and that we acknowledge this is really what it is like seeing how we view ourselves, acknowledging our self-loathing, uh, this embarrassment of who we are, denial. It's interesting that uh, Mingya Rinpoche in the book of his that we uh, also reviewed, In Love with the World, he talked about how even he had this embarrassment of who he was when he uh, let go of his um, role of this great teacher and hopped on a train in the lowest class in India and was with all these people that he would never mix with uh, or had never mixed with previously because he lived in a very protected, gilded world. So it's seeing this embarrassment that we have of who we are, this self-loathing, 
this continual self-evaluation and self-criticism. He uses the phrase neurotic tendencies from our lack of self-confidence. I remember from his Shambhala teachings, he talked about primordial confidence, that this is a quality that we have when we reach a, a very highly realized state. Uh, this going beyond this self-evaluation, the self criticism, the embarrassment of who we are, and just having, you might say, self-arisen or primordial confidence. That uh, we're going towards abandoning hope and fear. He would talk about, in other places, that uh, if you have hope, it means that you have fear, that literally hope lives on fear. You hope something's going to happen and you're afraid it's not going to happen, or you're afraid something's going to happen and you hope it doesn't happen. The two work together as a unit. So seeing this hope and fear that we have, this self-knowledge of this raw, rugged, clumsy ego, then is seeing this hope and fear, the play of hope and fear, and going towards abandoning it. He says that experiencing disappointment is a sign of our basic intelligence. A, I don't know what to call this, maybe a description, uh, an explanation, maybe that's a better word, an explanation that I heard very quickly when I started attending programs that were led by his students and from uh, the group which was affiliated with uh, Vajra, um, um, Vajra Datu and Shambhala training, that one of the people that uh, attended said there is uh, um, conventional logic and then there is Buddhist logic. And uh, so here we're talking about um, Buddhist logic, which just seems to go against conventional logic or conventional wisdom. That here, disappointment is a sign of basic intelligence, as opposed to normally disappointment means we don't get our way. And it's called a sign of our basic intelligence because it comes from seeing the irrelevance of our expectations. That we come to Buddhism, we come to the guru with all kinds of expectations. And if we have a productive relationship with the guru, that we start to see the irrelevance of these expectations. We're disappointed because our expectations aren't met. And that this counters the problem of spiritual materialism is using spirituality as a way of becoming comfortable. And that even when uh, the guru makes you uncomfortable or you have an ex 
unpleasant experience, uh, whether it be uh, in a Buddhist setting or whether it be at work or at home with your family, that uh, uh, seeing difficulty and uncomfortable experiences as being, oh, this is somehow or another a teaching from the guru, da, 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 as opposed to, I'm really uncomfortable here. This is difficult. I don't know what to do and so forth. In other words, um, rationalizing, denial, making excuses and so forth. He talks about thinking that the guru is on my side, that the guru is perfect. And uh, if he's on my side, then it's safe. And so all of this needs to be um, let go of. It might be little by little, slowly, slowly, but all of this is a problem in your relationship with the guru and your progress on the path. He uses the word that I've only run across in his teachings, and that is guru G, G U R U J I. So I, of course, went to the internet and did a search. Uh, and this is what I came up with for a definition. Quote, Guru G is a word made up of the Sanskrit word guru, meaning teacher, guide, or master. And the suffix G, which is commonly used in many South Asian uh, languages as a gender neutral honorific. As such, the whole term Guruji is a very respectful and affectionate term for one's guru or spiritual teacher. It may be used especially in Hinduism and Tibetan Buddhism. And I suspect since many of his students had spent time in India and then come back uh, that uh, he was referred to with that term, that honorific term uh, in the beginning at least uh, quite a lot. And obviously he didn't like the term uh, because it was giving him uh, in the person that was using it, an identity that he did not want to have. I think Lama La might be similar. La is an honorific ending that when you put it with Lama, it's just an honorific way of addressing the Lama. And I hear that a lot, both from actual Tibetans to Westerners. But anyway, he felt people referring to him that way, he felt it was suspicious that it leads to arrogance leads to people feeling, I made it. I'm right. I experienced this relationship with my wonderful guru. He said another, uh, you might say dead end or wrong turn on the path uh, of holding back is feeling in his words, very genteel sophisticated, dignified, where there are no, in his words, sudden shocks, no hard landings, 
quote, surrendering means just landing on hard, ordinary ground on rocky, wild countryside. Once we open ourselves, we land on what is, end of quote. So we have to let go of both of these ways of relating to the girl. We have to expect that there will be hard landings, that things will not be as gentle as we would like to have them. So he talks about identifying with the lowest of the low. is helpful, that it's a sign of the, um, of psychologically surrendering, the rugged quality of psychologically surrendering. Physical surrendering is expressed by doing prostrations. For those of you that have uh, at least started Nundro, that's the first practice is a prostrations. And it is putting yourself flat on the floor with your arms outstretched, your belly on the floor and your legs outstretched behind you where you are as low as you can get and still be on the surface of the floor. And since we haven't attained city, we can't go through the floor and be lower than the floor. So um, when we enter the, uh, the shrine room, it, it is uh, customary to do three half prostrations where we're on our hands and knees but our arms are not outstretched. Our belly is not on the floor. But uh, the first practice of Nundro is called going for refuge. And it is this uh, act of surrendering physically by doing these full prostrations over and over and over again. So there is physical surrendering, and then there is this psychological surrendering of identifying with the lowest of the low. He then talks about uh, refuge in the three jewels in a way that is unusual but it's quite important and it gives you a particular view of refuge in the three jewels. So the uh, refuge in the three jewels means uh, taking refuge in the Buddha, in the Dharma and the Sangha. And this is, first of all, taking refuge in the Buddha is, he is an example of surrendering. He is an example of acknowledging the negativity that is, we all have, that is part of our makeup and opening up to it. Further on, he talks about uh, taking refuge in the three jewels or the guru specifically as protection from uh, the undesirable is an incorrect view of refuge. It's not like going to mommy or daddy when you're eight years old for protection. 
that it is uh, taking refuge in the Buddha, is acknowledging our negativity, opening up to it. And then the Dharma, he calls it the law of existence. And this is one of the definitions of Dharma. The Dharma has a lot of different definitions in Buddhism. So he describes this as opening up to life as it is. Again, uh, this raw, rugged quality, unpredictability. Uh, rather than seeing it uh, as something fantastically spiritual, seeing things through uh, a example that we in the West use uh, through rose-colored glasses. That just seeing life as it is, the way it works. rather than some uh, fantasy or expectations that we have. And quite honestly, my experience has been that um, life does not usually go the way that I would expect it to go or like it to go, that it just kind of has its way of unfolding. And it can be a, to use his words, a rather uh, rough and raw ride. And then Sangha, this is the community of people on the spiritual path. Frequently, it is used in terms of the ordained sangha, people, monks and nuns, for instance, or highly realized teachers. But here he talks about it being the community of your spiritual uh, brothers and sisters. And he said, the way we relate to them is that I'm willing to share my experience with these fellow travelers but not lean on them. That we are traveling with them, but if we lean on each other, then if one stumbles and falls, we all go down. So to kind of sum this up, he feels, first of all, this is a very profound way of viewing refuge and the three jewels the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, that uh, we're not seeking shelter. We're not looking for a higher being to protect us. Quote, we surrender because we would like to communicate with the world as it is. End quote. So we are not elevated and looking at this as being very profound. And we are not seeing ourselves as low and stupid. That we present um, ourselves to everything, we hide nothing to our object of surrender and to our guru, we present everything to him or her. Quote, it means working together with inspiration so that one becomes an open vessel into which knowledge can be poured. So again, if you do not open up to your guru, then the guru cannot know exactly what it is that you need to learn, what teachings you need to hear, what practices you need to do, and so forth. But the best relationship 
And the stories about uh, these great masters of the past, like Marpa and Milarepa, is that Milarepa became like an open vessel and the teachings were just poured into him like you would pour water from a pitcher into a glass. We also acknowledge that uh, our richness, our inherent qualities and potential and so forth, rather than in his words, our imagined poverty of being. He talked a lot about the poverty mentality that human beings have and specifically his students. Quote, we know we are worthy to receive teachings, worthy of relating ourselves to the wealth of the opportunities for learning. The question is a, a long one, but the, uh, the person has been to India and heard that term Guruji a lot, and it was always used respectfully. And uh, she just can't figure out why he would not want to have his students use that term that uh, reading his book and hearing about um, this commentary on his teachings is like a push me pull you from um, uh, Dr. Doolittle, I believe it is, uh, which is an animal that had two front ends. Uh, and so anyway, he did not want to be seen as being exotic. He did not want to be seen as, you know, almost mythical. He spoke in English, very good English. In fact, a lot of times his understanding of English and the definition of English words was better than his students, where English was their first language. And um, he wanted a more direct relationship without fantasies and expectations, without people thinking that, well, he is this crazy wisdom master from Tibet, yada, 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 yada. And uh, in a way, he was a push me, pull you, that he was, uh, to use a, uh, an American phrase, he constantly was pushing your buttons. He knew exactly where they were. They were ego buttons. And so he did make people feel uncomfortable and it was intentional. The question is related to this raw quality and surrendering uh, this attitude you have towards yourself and so forth, uh, is that related to the paramitas? And to the best of my knowledge, uh, uh, in a way, it's an indirect relationship. What it really is, is the surrendering is getting to know yourself, uh, overcoming denial, overcoming, uh, we have uh, so much self-loathing for ourselves, uh, really looking at ourselves honestly, looking at our qualities, looking at our potential, learning how to trust ourselves more, and not getting hijacked by ego. Honesty here is honesty with yourself, 
what you think of yourself, how you see yourself, that little monkey mind, what that little monkey mind is telling you. It has nothing to do with how you relate to other people. It's really how you're relating to yourself. Okay. But now to go on with what the, uh, the questioner was talking about, from the standpoint of Chogyam Trumpa, a realized master, a crazy wisdom master, he was beyond right or wrong. That what came out of his mouth was beyond right or wrong. It was more spontaneous wisdom. And sometimes it could be a little brutal, but it wasn't even, it was even beyond being honest and not being honest. It was above all of that because all of that is conceptual. And this again is an indication of how realized he was. And I believe we kind of talked about that in the, the introduction 